open mind is the only kind who don't need to travel to find something new and who know when you spend less, you can discover even more at TJ Maxx and Marshalls. In the moment, it'll <laughs> 50 years in the making. So Michael Strahan has blown a lot happening now. Today, city leaders voting on a citywide COVID-19 registry, who it's for and how it would work next. A huge step in the battle against COVID-19. What Pfizer is saying about its vaccine and how it could lead to vaccinating young teenagers soon. And President Biden releasing his infrastructure plan today. The huge price tag and how he plans to pay for it coming up. Cooler air is spilling into town and you'll notice it especially tomorrow morning. I'll tell you how cold and where along with the system that's going to affect us over the holiday weekend. All that coming right up. As we approach one of the holiest weekends of the year, the San Antonio Archdiocese changing some of its COVID-19 protocols, what it means for parishioners coming up. The News at 5 starts right now. And first at five, a human error. That's why federal officials say production of Johnson & Johnson's one-dose COVID-19 vaccine has been halted. About 15 million doses ruined at a Baltimore manufacturing plant where two COVID vaccines are being made, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and AstraZeneca. According to the New York Times, the Food and Drug Administration is investigating and has halted future shipments for the moment, Johnson and Johnson vaccines that are currently being used nationwide, we're told, were not affected. Here at home, every Texan 16 and older is eligible to get a vaccine as of this week, but finding an appointment's been difficult for some. As we've been reporting, other big cities have already been using wait lists or registries where people sign up and are later contacted when it's their turn to get the vaccine. But San Antonio has largely left it up to residents to snag appointments on their own as they open up until now. Garrett Berger joins us now with news of City Council approving the creation of a registry. Garrett. Absolutely, that's right. Now, city staff have previously recommended against the creation of a registry, but it's not the first time that councils talked about it. District 9 Councilman John Courage has pushed the idea in the past, even forcing a vote on it last month, which ended up failing. But now vaccine eligibility is expanded and elected officials have said there still isn't enough vaccine coming in. So Courage, along with District 3's Rebecca Villagran and District 7's Ana Sandoval, called for a special council meeting on it, which happened today. It was at that meeting that council, vote, council members voted what sounded like unanimously, it was a voice vote, to create a pilot program for a new registry. Texas residents can enter their info into that registry that various vaccine providers could pull names from to sign people up for appointments, both for when new doses are coming in or in cases when they have extras because of no shows and need to find someone to use the doses on. Staff say they're going to prioritize people 65 and up for now and that the city has the participation of all four of the mass vaccination providers. Now, participation okay. can be defined differently, but they have all said that um, when they get to that point, they will reach out to this database and request names of people who meet the criteria of the populations that they wish to serve. This isn't coming up right away, though. Staff estimated it could take three to four weeks before a registry could go online for you to sign up. Now, council members and staff made sure to emphasize that this will not increase the number of vaccines in the community, just make it easier for you to get your appointment. And Assistant City Manager Colleen Bridger said there have been increases in doses at pharmacies. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thanks, Garrett. Meantime, a huge shot in the arm today for COVID-19 vaccinations. The company Pfizer announcing today that its clinical trial on children 15 to 12 years old showed its vaccine is 100% effective. This opens up all sorts of possibilities for kids and adults at risk by the end of the year. So I, the good news with this information is that they're going to be able to apply to the FDA to just basically add an amendment to their existing authorization. So that means that for kids 12 to 15, hopefully they'll be able to start getting vaccinated by summer, um, late summer, so that they'll be ready for the next school year. Pfizer sticking it to the coronavirus again, the first to be proven effective in children younger than 16. Getting emergency use authorization now from the FDA will impact mass vaccination sites in just a few months. And that will actually impact the elderly, too, in a good way. 
We know that vaccinating older people is, again, important for preventing hospitalizations and deaths. But when you look at models of pandemic flu and other illnesses, when you have a limited amount of vaccine, if you can vaccinate younger people, you can prevent more transmissions. That means older people who have not yet managed to get vaccinated will potentially have less chance of getting the virus, bringing us closer to herd immunity. And already Pfizer is testing this vaccine on even younger kids. And for the younger kids, they're hopeful to have some of that data by the end of this year so that maybe early 2022, we're looking at kids you know, less than 12 years of age getting vaccine or being available potentially. Even though this will likely mean there'll be more people in line for the vaccine soon, Dr. Bowling says that production planning to expand has already begun. So if there's no supply chain shortages or disruptions, it should not impact anybody's access to the shot. The Archdiocese of San Antonio relaxing some of its COVID-19 restrictions that have been in place for about a year now. Effective today, parishes may open all pews and reduce social distancing from six feet to three feet. Other protocols, though, like mask wearing, still a requirement. The Archdiocese says it will continue to evaluate the health situation and will make future changes as it sees fit. We are learning more about a deadly shooting in the medical center on Monday. A 22 year old Jonathan Rene Viegas now facing a manslaughter charge after investigators say he fatally shot a man at the Oaks at Northgate Apartments on Oakdale Way. Arrest records state a witness called 911 after the victim, Luis Castellar, was shot. The caller told officers he was playing video games and Castellar was handling a recently purchased AR-15 when it suddenly went off. Investigators were later contacted by an attorney representing the suspect. When they questioned the witness once more, he told investigators he call, he saw Castellar hand the gun to Viegas, and then the gun went off. Castellar fell to the ground, and then he said that Viegas took off running. He was arrested yesterday. His bond now set at $75,000. Do you recognize this woman? The New Braunfels Police Department believes she may have information about a shooting earlier this year. They're also looking for the two cars that you see in this video. In a Facebook post, the department says the shooting happened back on February 27th on a Highway 46 South. The video surveillance taken from a hotel where a disturbance occurred prior to that shooting. If you have any information on the suspect or either of these cars, call the Comal County Crime Stoppers at 830-620. TIPS. San Antonio police have arrested a man who caused a deadly crash back in November. 27 year old Mario Preciado is charged with intoxication manslaughter. Arrest records state he was intoxicated, was speeding along the I-35 access road at Southwest Military when he rear ended a car that was stopped at a red light. The driver of the car, Arthur Salas, died from his injuries. Preciado was arrested yesterday. His bond set at $205,000. It is day three in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who is facing charges in George Floyd's death. Today, new witnesses took the stand, including the store clerk who Floyd had passed a counterfeit bill to. Jurors in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin hearing today from Christopher Martin, the clerk at Cup Foods who received the counterfeit $20 bill from George Floyd on the day he died. When I um, saw the bill, I noticed that it had a blue pigment to it, kind of how a $100 bill will have, and I found that odd, so I assumed that it was fake. The prosecution playing surveillance video from both inside and outside the store as Martin described how he felt that day. Uh, disbelief, then guilt. Okay. Why guilt? Um, if I would have just not taken the bill, this could have been avoided. The jury also hearing from Christopher Belfry, who recorded the incident from his car. We've seen them placing him in the police car, so that's all I seen and I kept on driving. I thought he was detained. I thought it was over, so I kept on going home. Over the past three days, the jury has heard from numerous witnesses to Floyd's death, including Genevieve Hansen, a firefighter and EMT who was off duty that day and begged officers to let her help. And when you couldn't do that, how did that make you feel? Totally distressed. Frustrated? Yes. 
Darnella Frazier, the teenager who recorded that now viral video of Floyd's death, also took the stand. I heard George Floyd saying, <clears throat> I can't breathe, please get off of me. I can't breathe. He, he cried for his mom. He was in pain. It seemed like he knew. Seemed like he knew it was over for him. Chauvin is facing manslaughter and second and third degree murder charges to which he has pleaded not guilty. The three other officers involved in Floyd's death go on trial later this year. Trevor Alt, ABC News, New York. The IRS says payments are going out this weekend for Social Security recipients and other people who qualify to get it but don't normally file a tax return. The IRS says employees are working tirelessly to deliver the economic impact payments as quickly as possible and estimates the majority of payments will be received April 7th. President Biden in Pittsburgh today releasing a new $2 trillion infrastructure plan. His proposal calls for huge building projects around the country that his administration says would create thousands, if not millions of jobs. ABC's Mary Alice Parks explains the next steps and the political reality for Biden's plan. President Biden says America's communities are in desperate need of repair. So with sweeping language, he is now pitching a massive and ambitious investment in the nation's infrastructure. His team saying overnight, this is the moment to reimagine and rebuild a new American economy. In Pittsburgh today, the president outlining his new plan, which calls for billions of dollars for new roads and bridges, new investments in public transportation and broadband internet, especially in rural parts of the country, and replacing 100% of lead pipes. At a hearing last week, President Biden's new Secretary of Transportation saying the investments could also help fight climate change. Every dollar we spend rebuilding from a climate-driven disaster is a dollar we could have spent building a more competitive, modern and resilient transportation system that produces significantly lower emissions. On Capitol Hill, the conversation already underway on how to pay for it all. The Biden administration proposing an increase to the corporate tax rate from 21 percent to 28 percent, as well as adding new penalties for corporations that move jobs overseas. Money for infrastructure helps us revitalize our economy and create new jobs, but the pay for will be undoing some of the Trump tax cuts. It's exactly those tax increases that Republicans are likely to firmly oppose. Let's see what this infrastructure package looks like. If it's a Trojan horse for a massive tax increase, put me down as highly skeptical. Even getting all 50 Democrats in the Senate to agree could be very difficult for the president. But President Biden says he's just getting started. The White House plans to propose changes to what they call human and care infrastructure next. Pitches like paid family leave and universal pre-K still to come. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, Washington. We have a reminder, if you haven't registered to vote, you only have one more day. The deadline to register to vote in the May 1st city and school election is tomorrow, April 1st. You can check your registration status and find out how to register right now on our website, ksat.com. Gusty out there. That's the big headline this afternoon is the wind. You look at the wind out of the north, still steady at 20 miles per hour at the airport here in San Antonio and surrounding areas. Fairly similar readings. Of course, it's fluctuating a little bit. We're seeing some gusts up to 30 and that's going to be the case early this evening. But around and after midnight, we're going to see the wind really subside. Temperatures falling down through the 60s. 8 p.m. 62 by 10 p.m. 60 and then you'll feel a bit of a chill in the air tomorrow morning. I'll detail how cool and where along with the system that'll affect us this weekend coming up. Ursula. Thank you, Adam. Yogurt, it's full of nutrients and a lot of good stuff, but a lot of added sugar most of the time. It doesn't have to be like that. Up next, we're going to tell you how to make it from scratch without sacrificing flavor. New at five, DIY yogurt. The stuff you buy at the supermarket, it is convenient and tasty, but it can have more sugar than you realize. So 12 on your side's Marilyn Moore. It shows us how to get your protein and your probiotics at the same time as you save some money by making your own. 
Think of yogurt as healthy? Look closely at the nutrition labels. You're likely to see a lot of added sugars. One solution is make your own. You can buy freeze dried yogurt cultures online or at health food stores, but if you have a favorite brand of plain yogurt already, just save a few tablespoons of it and use that as a starter for your homemade yogurt. Then all you need is milk and a food thermometer. You can use any type of pasteurized dairy milk you'd like, but avoid those labeled ultra pasteurized because your yogurt won't thicken up properly. So here's the gist. Heat the milk to 185 degrees and maintain that for 10 minutes. Let your milk sit until it cools to 110 degrees. Skim it and add your starter. Next, it will need to ferment up to 12 hours in your oven with light and oven off then into the fridge to thicken. There are other ways to make yogurt, the sous vide method and the instant pot. The sous vide method delivered consistently excellent yogurt every time. The instant pot should have been able to also maintain a constant temperature, but the results were disappointing, even after fermenting it for three times longer than the sous vide yogurt. If you'd rather leave it to the pros, Consumer Report says this Faye True Blend low-fat Greek yogurt is one of the healthier options at the grocery store. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Live cam out there right now, 73 degrees. This is an odd day. <laughs> Overcast. Not so bad to start the day, got a little chillier. It even bumpy. drizzled a little bit. Yeah we, yeah, we had a few sprinkles, a little bumpy temperature wise. Sunshine right now is really helping us out quite a bit temperature wise. So we're seeing that increase in the readings, but it's still gusty out there. Now the wind will gradually be diminishing as we go through the night. It'll be a cooler start to the day tomorrow because so that north wind is pushing in some cooler air. And we're looking at a little bit of dampness as we get into this upcoming weekend. We have a system that's going to be affecting us. So we're going to talk about all of it right now, starting with the wind. That's been a big headline today. Latest gusts are coming in around 30 miles per hour, mostly in the upper 20s. That's what we're seeing in terms of the wind speeds, or at least the gusts, I should say. The actual sustained winds are around 20 miles per hour locally, even up into the hill country and elsewhere, about 15 to 20. So let's Take a look at our future cast and go through the night. Get to 10 o'clock, still a bit breezy out there. Steady north wind at about 15 to 20 miles per hour. Get to midnight and especially thereafter, and we'll see that wind start to diminish. So by sunrise tomorrow, we're looking at a basically a five to 10 mile per hour wind for most of South Texas. Some higher gusts, but nothing like what we had throughout the day today. So the wind gradually diminishing overnight tonight, but that north wind dropped the humidity. Dew points are down to near 40 degrees, even into the 30s in the hill country. And so we've got that drier, less humid air in place, and it's going to remain intact basically into this upcoming weekend. And then by early next week, you'll notice stickiness back in the air. So enjoy this lack of mugginess the rest of this week through the weekend. And then early next week, humidity's back with that flow coming off the Gulf of Mexico. Let's talk about our overall weather pattern. Pretty quiet across Texas. The activity is basically along the eastern seaboard and parts of the southeastern United States. I wish we had some of their moisture, but unfortunately, no. Plenty of clouds, but not much to show for them. Here's our next system that's going to affect us this weekend. It's still over the Pacific, just west of the Baja Peninsula there. You see that counterclockwise circulation aloft in the upper levels. That's going to be headed our way this weekend, and it's going to be a disheveled upper level system. There's really not a whole lot of organization to it but it'll be enough to help generate a few light showers on Saturday. And I think overall a fairly gray upcoming Easter weekend. But in terms of the actual rain chances, I mean, on Saturday we give it about a 30% shot. So not a lot of coverage across South Texas on Saturday. Then we get into Sunday and it's mainly just drizzle and fog in the morning. All right, so that's it for the rain chances. Again, not all that promising. Just a few hit or miss sprinkles this weekend. Temperature wise, you get 50s in the Panhandle, up to 83 with that sunshine in Del Rio, 72 Laredo, Junction at 70, San Antonio right now at 74. Sunshine going a long ways out there in some locations, Gonzales at 71. But fast forward to tomorrow morning, the calming wind, clear sky and this dry air, temperatures falling down into the upper 30s in the hill country. So we're talking 37 in Kerrville and Fredericksburg. Junction about 34 tomorrow morning. Uvalde 44 along with the Gonzales, 45 here in San Antonio. You get to Bernie 39 in Timberwood Park, 41 for a morning low. Then by the afternoon, we rebound nicely up near 70 degrees, partly cloudy. 
and not as gusty. We're looking at an east wind at 5 to 15 miles per hour. Next couple of days, really uneventful, comfortable 70, partly cloudy. The weekend, that little bit of dampness, but temperatures pleasant right near 70. Easter morning again, some morning fog and drizzle. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right, the Spurs back in action tonight against a familiar foe. Yeah, and this is a team that, of course, should not have beat them, but they did hit 18 three-pointers. When we come back, the Spurs have a tough stretch here. Even though it's at home, they'll have to play three games in four nights starting tonight again. And the final four is set here in San Antonio coming up. Our San Antonio Spurs continue their nine-game homestand tonight, looking for only their second win in the AT&T Center during this historic stretch, and also looking to bounce back against the Sacramento Kings, who destroyed them from the three-point line on Monday night with a 132-115 victory to push the Spurs down to the eighth playoff spot going into the ninth rematch. Spurs will have some help. Lonnie Walker, the fourth, is expected to return after missing the last four games with a sore right wrist, and we're expecting the debut of newly acquired center Gorgie Zhang off the bench. Derek White was asked what they need to do better tonight. They're a good transition team, so we got to be better on that aspect. And then um, getting out to the shooters, making it more difficult for them in the pick and roll, stuff like that. So definitely a lot we can look at and improve on for the next game. All right, highlights for you tonight on the night beat after the 7.30 tip-off. Texas Longhorns run at the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament here in San Antonio has come to an end, but only after getting a lot farther than most people thought until they ran into number one seed South Carolina last night in the Dome. Before you could say Final Four, the Horns are down 14-2 to two to start the game, played from behind the rest of the night. The Horns only shot 23% for the game, and off this miss, Zia Cook shows why she was a leading scorer with 16 taking it to the house. San Antonio's Kyra Lambert was held at just four points, and the team went 0 for 15 in the fourth quarter, the 62-34 loss. We haven't started well for the past two games. Um, after the first quarter, you know, we're just trying to regroup, um, get it together on the defensive end, and credit to South Carolina. I mean, they played a great ball game. They guarded us like we like to guard, um, and it just wasn't our night. All right, the Stanford Cardinal are in the Final Four, but only after they had to come from behind down 38-26 to in the half against Louisville. Even San Antonio's own Kiana Williams was just one of 11 from the field. But Stanford bounced back in the second half behind sophomore Ashton Prechtel, who came off the bench to score 16 points in 16 minutes to help field a 17-2 run in the third quarter. And they had a big-time three to start the fourth quarter, and Stanford never trailed again. Kiana also rebounded well herself in the second half, shooting 5 of 9 to finish with 14 in the 78-63 victory. So the Final Four set here in San Antonio. Stanford will face South Carolina on Friday at 5 in the Alamo Dome, and Arizona will go up against UConn in the late game at 8.30, and this is the court they will play on. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Two more lawsuits accusing Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson of sexual assault and inappropriate conduct have now been filed, bringing the total to 21 overall. And coming up tonight on the night beat, what his attorney, Deshaun Watson's attorney, has to say about that. All right. Thank you, Greg. You got it. We'll be right back.